Welcome, educators and champions of physical and health education. I'm Josh Reed, and I'm excited to be starting on this journey with you. Today, we're diving into a topic that we've seen across the country and in schools as young as elementary. Join us for today's conversation as we navigate the complexities around vaping and nicotine, how withdrawal can impact the school day, challenges faced by you, the educator, and strategies for supporting your students. Today, we're joined by Dr. Taya Rosick, a child and adolescent psychiatrist at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, and Ryan Foy, lead programs and resources at PHE Canada who works closely with school communities, taking a comprehensive approach to address commercial tobacco use and vaping in their schools. We hope this episode can provide some insights and tools to address vaping within your school and empower you to gain a better understanding of vaping in general. Before we get started, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that I'm living, working, and recording this episode on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. Given today's topic, I also want to acknowledge the contribution and role of elders in communities across Turtle Island for their teachings, wisdom, and insight surrounding sacred tobacco and its place in culture. Let's take a listen. Hi, Tia and Ryan. Thank you for both being here. Could you just share a little bit about how you engage with youth in and around vaping? Yeah, absolutely. For everyone tuning in, welcome. Thanks for spending a bit of your day with us here today. Like Josh mentioned, my name is Ryan. I've been with Physical and Health Education Canada now for about five years. And over the last three years, I've been a part of a really great project around reducing smoking and vaping among youth working in school communities across the country. Over the last three years, we've learned a lot about uh, what youth are saying in terms of what we know about vaping in different parts of the country and what vaping uh, prevalence is looking like, uh, some of the challenges around that, and just some of the learnings that we've had along the way in terms of building out our resources and listening to the youth and what they need to make change in their school community and among their peers. So I'm really excited to be here, excited to share more as we get going, Um, but for now, I'll turn it over to Taya. Thanks, Ryan. Super nice to be here with you, Ryan and Josh. My name is Taya Rosick. I'm a child psychiatrist, which means I'm a medical doctor working with children, adolescents, and their families when they're experiencing mental health concerns. And I run the Substance Use and Concurrent Disorders Program at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario in Ottawa, which really focuses on helping adolescents who are having problematic substance use and other mental health concerns. In my day-to-day work, I see many young people who want to make changes to their nicotine use, um, are maybe having a hard time stopping vaping on their own. I also see adolescents who are brought in because their parents are worried about their substance use or because they're experiencing negative consequences from substance use. Uh, For example, it's impacting their mental health, uh, their physical health, their relationships or their functioning at school or at home. So I think this is a, a very important conversation and I'm pleased to be part of it. Brilliant. For our listeners, I think I speak for myself too. Why are children and youth coming to see you? What is that step? Are they reaching some sort of threshold? Yeah, absolutely. You know, as I mentioned, psychiatrists are are medical doctors, which means that in order to to be seen by a psychiatrist, you have to either get a referral from family physicians or um, a walk-in clinic or to come in through the emergency department, specifically because they're experiencing difficulties with their mental health. Unfortunately, it's uh, it can sometimes take quite a while for young people to see a psychiatrist. And oftentimes, by the time they are are seen, some of their mental health difficulties are more severe than we'd like. There are, of course, many, many other mental health professionals in the system that young people can see from school counselors to psychotherapists to social workers to their primary care providers like pediatricians and, and family physicians. But psychiatry kind of fits in uh, sort of at that kind of specialized level of the spectrum. What would be the trend that you're seeing over the last kind of five years? It's quite concerning that there's absolutely no doubt that vaping is an alarming new phenomenon over the last few years for a number of reasons. And unfortunately, because of ease of access to vaping devices, targeted marketing that's affecting young people, and also the incredibly addictive nature that nicotine has is leading many adolescents to to try and then also to continue vaping. I think there is an illusion in part because of how e-cigarettes first developed that vaping is safe. And, and this is an illusion because we, we really have little to no research evidence on the actual health effects of vaping. 
But we definitely know through, you know, both national studies like the Canadian Tobacco and Nicotine Survey and provincial studies like the Ontario Student Drug Use and Mental Health Survey that about 15% of high school students have been vaping in the last month. So that's an alarming number for sure. Coming to you, Ryan, and offering that little perspective, why are we seeing such high numbers of youth vaping? Taya nailed it with the accessibility piece, right? I feel, you know, what we've heard from youth in the schools that we've been working in is that they can easily access these products. And companies know this, and they're very sophisticated to get around any provincial or federal regulations that exist. So a great example is most youth maybe don't have a credit card, but have a debit card. And a lot of companies online will be happy to sell you a product using Interact eTransfer. And they've even gotten so sophisticated in that some of those companies will actually use like a candy name or a food name within their actual description. So when it shows up as a transaction on that student debit card, the caregivers just thinks they maybe purchased food when in reality, they potentially were purchasing bait products. So uh, we can unpack that for sure a little bit later. But I would say another thing that we're seeing in schools as well, and Taya kind of mentioned this just earlier on, you know, folks want change. You know, youth are upset. They're upset that they were vulnerable and that they 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 fell into this addiction because of the lack of information, lack of frank and honest conversations with youth at earlier ages. And conversations with youth, not at youth, are huge. And we have a lot of outdated curriculum right now that does not explicitly focus on education around things like vaping and smoking. Those are just some of the things that I think that uh, that we've seen. You know, I think another one that's that's really really big is the flavors. We know that youth are are going after attractive flavors, uh, breakfast flavors, candy flavors. Uh, it's just really really making it easier and attractive for them to uh, participate in that. So, uh, lots of work to be done, but uh, but lots of really good learnings that that we can bring here today from that as well. So what we're seeing is the the ease of accessibility, the marketing, you know, is being branded for youth and they're making it easy for the purchases. Youth are accessing it and it's easy, but what's the impact beyond trying it and, you know, moving into that addiction realm and the things you're seeing around that mental health here? So I think, Josh, in order to really understand what's happening for young people in their brains, we need to, I think, take a step back and understand why youth are at risk for substance use in the first place. And it's it's really about how our brains develop. And so it's the very front part of our brains, the, the part that we call the prefrontal cortex that helps us to make decisions, helps us to plan, stops us from acting on impulse. That's actually the last part of our brains that matures throughout young adulthood. And the actual maturation of the brain really starts in in our adolescence with what we call the limbic system. And so that's deep in our brains. And that part of the brain is responsible for our emotions, including pleasure, as well as our memory. And so there are many research studies looking at adolescent brains. And what we see is that there's increased activity in that limbic system, in that emotion, pleasure, memory system. And youth experience increased sensitivity to rewards and to pleasure. And this is multiplied many times over in the context of substance use without the ability to really inhibit, put the brakes on, or make sometimes thoughtful decisions about what we're going to do. So I think going back to the development of our brains is is important to understanding why young people are more vulnerable to substance use. There's also many important things to consider around youth's mental health when it comes to making decisions around trying substances, because there are many different reasons that young people may, may try vaping for the first time. You know, one super common one is is to fit in, right? They're uh, doing it because others are doing it or they think others are doing it and they want to be accepted. But another reason is for many youth to, to feel good or to feel better. So they may be trying to decrease their stress decrease their anxiety, improve their mood, or or cope with other mental health symptoms that are going on. And for the population of of young people I see in my clinic, that's actually a really common reason both for starting nicotine vaping and for continuing it. Youth are trying to manage their mental health. There's been many stressors going on in their lives, particularly in the context of the pandemic recently, and they just want to feel better. So I think keeping that in mind when we ask ourselves as educators or as parents, why is, you know, this adolescent engaging in a behavior that we worry about and we think could be harmful? Oftentimes there's pretty, pretty relevant reason for them. Absolutely. I think what 
you're mentioning here is there's a trend there's it's far beyond just oh because my friends are doing it there's there's so much more to kind of unpack there in and around the, the developmental side both of that person socially but also you know mentally and physically but also that coping mechanism and i think that's kind of something we may forget that there's other things that go on in youth lives beyond just oh my friends do it because i want to do it. it becomes that mechanism to cope Ryan, I don't know if you could share, you know, how how may educators see this within the school day? What does that look like? There's some really alarming statistics around youth vaping as soon as they wake up in the morning. And I think the statistic in 2021 was around 10% of youth who were vaping are vaping within the first five minutes of waking up in the morning. And so what that really does is puts us in this state of dysregulation, where from the moment we wake up, we have this nicotine, this highly addictive chemical uh, that Tay was talking about is just flowing through our system. And so then, you know, if you kind of follow that path of that student throughout the day, well, you know, maybe they're using that product first thing in the morning, then they're using it again before they start school, they're using it at recess, they're using it in class, between classes, through the hallways, because you're constantly needing to fill that void or you're constantly needing to ease that stress or that anxiety that comes with the withdrawal when the nicotine leaves the body. And so this cycle just perpetuates itself with folks who are vaping throughout their entire day. And whether you're in school or you're at work, you know, it's just it's just a really hard situation to be in. And so we know that, I mean, we have breakfast programs in schools because we know that kids learn better when they're not hungry. And when we talk about something that's highly addictive, like vaping, take hunger and multiply that by five. And that's really what you're feeling when you need to respond to that craving and to, to have that vape product. And so that's why it's so prevalent. And that's why it's so hard in schools because it almost becomes a vice to survive the school day. When in reality, it's, it's really pulling this, that student back from having that quality opportunity to learn, to have that, just that sense of, of comfort throughout their school day and just to kind of have a normal functioning life. And so it's a really, it's a really challenging and complex situation. And that's why I'm glad we have folks like Tay on here to help us unpack that. But yeah, it's just, it's just really hard to see that when you see those statistics that, you know, really we're putting our bodies just in a, in a, in a state of dysregulation from the moment we wake up is really concerning for sure. And you know, Ryan, I'm, I'm really glad that you mentioned this. I think this is one of the most important things for educators to really understand. And, and once again, it goes back to brain science, right? How nicotine works in the brain, you know, how it acts in states of intoxication, but also in states of withdrawal. So nicotine, you know, when we've ingested it by, you know, inhalation, for example, it binds to nicotine receptors in the brain very, very quickly, triggering this release of chemicals that cause the feelings of pleasure but its effects go away just as quickly. So, you know, in about an hour and a half or two hours, we start to lose that effect of nicotine in the brain and we experience what we call withdrawal symptoms. And so those medically include intense cravings, irritability, restlessness, feelings of nervousness or anxiety, depressed mood, poor concentration, which is something I see many, many young people reporting is such a problem during the school day, headaches, problems sleeping, increased appetite, And so just as Ryan was saying, you can imagine that this state of withdrawal would really affect our learning and how we can function at school, especially when classes tend to be an an hour and a half long. Um, The school day is about eight hours long. And so I, I think it's just so important for educators to actually know this because, you know, in any given class that they're they're teaching, there could be several students who are actually undergoing this experience. I think it's also important to keep in mind that of course, different substances have different withdrawal syndromes that are associated with them. And so, you know, what we're describing right now is how nicotine withdrawal may look, but of course, something like cannabis withdrawal would look different. Just really critical to know to understand what kids are going through day to day. So Tay, as you mentioned, the withdrawal there, it's kind of a difficult question to ask. As you say, every individual is different. How can educators, parents, you know, recognize those withdrawal signs and and help? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, again, some of those symptoms that I listed are the typical or classical symptoms of nicotine withdrawal, but certainly not every youth will have all of those symptoms or be equally as distressed by the symptoms. And many young people have no idea that what they're going through is actually related to nicotine withdrawal. There's a place and a need both for educating adolescents about what happens in their bodies when they're using nicotine and when it's exiting their system, as well as educating, you know, teachers and parents and other people who can observe these things in them. I I also think that the other piece that many youth don't know, and certainly many educators and parents don't know is, 
is what's actually in the vape. You know, we know that there's a few different types of vapes or e-cigarettes. Um, some are disposable. Some have pods that can be refilled, that can be replaced. Typically, pods have a volume of two milliliters. And then there's nicotine concentration to the pods. There may be flavors. Uh, there are certainly other chemicals that we have no idea of their long-term impacts. But in July 2021, Health Canada actually banned the, the legal sale of nicotine concentrations that are above 20 milligrams per milliliter in legal stores. But many adolescents and many high school students under the age of 19, are actually much less commonly accessing their vaping devices and products from those stores. And they continue to have access to much higher concentrations of nicotine, including things like 50 milligrams per, per milliliter concentrations. Once again, just in the spirit of being able to wrap our heads around what this is doing to a youth's brain and body, if a youth has one of these two milliliter pods that has 50 milligrams per ml concentration, that's actually 100 milligrams of nicotine in one of those pods. And to compare that to cigarettes, which you know we're, we may be more familiar with, a cigarette is about one to two milligrams of nicotine. So a pod of the 50 milligrams per ml strength is equivalent to about three packs of cigarettes. Once again, just putting things together to understand what are young people actually going through in their brains and their bodies, and it's pretty significant. Well, that's quite a lot of them. You put it in perspective with the cigarettes that really clicked it for me. Uh, kind of going back to where we were before with the marketing side of things, do you feel that youth know what they're purchasing? I'll let Taya weigh in on this too, but that's a really good point, Josh, about the misinformation and the lack of education around the product. That's really where we're at right now in Canada. And we were working with a school in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, and we had a student, grade eight student, come up to us and say, Mr. Ryan, this is all great, but the other day I, I saw this influencer on TikTok was sharing a video of vitamin infused vapes. So those have to be healthy, right? And so we ended up having this really great conversation about that. And I didn't believe the student at first. I was like, I got to see this. So sure enough, the student shows me this video of an influencer promoting these vitamin infused vapes. And they were also being promoted as what's called zero nick. So they had zero nicotine in them. So we had this really great conversation about, well, there's still other harmful ingredients in these products. The heating temperature of these products can melt the glass, the plastic, the metals that you then inhale in your lungs. And it's probably best from a harm reduction standpoint to avoid trying these products. But then turns out, you know, two months after that conversation with the student, those vitamin infused vapes were actually pulled off the market because they're making people more sick. So even though something was marketed as a healthier, quote unquote, healthier alternative and youth are buying into that, it was actually making youth even more sick. So there's a lot of misinformation out there, but I'll turn it over to Taya too. She may have some, some things to add on that as well. Yeah. And, you know, Ryan, the example that you gave is great because in what you're saying, this young person was actually able to show you what they were looking at. I think that's one of the important things, again, for families and for teachers and educators is to, to actually know what youth are looking at and what they're exposed to. And if we don't ask questions, if we don't, you know, show an interest to really understand, uh, we won't know what they're seeing. So I think that's an, an important thing to keep in mind is that open conversations, seeing what is being advertised to young people, assessing their level of understanding and how they're uh, kind of integrating this bombardment of information that they're getting is important to help them make decisions because ultimately they are making decisions and they've got to do so with adequate information and with some guidance. As we kind of move through the conversation and one thing that I'm really thinking of is, is the educator, you know, teaching throughout the day in school. I would say across the country, there's a zero tolerance of vaping within the school building. But when we kind of have this conversation around the advertisement, the marketing, the ease of access, the percentages of intake, the withdrawal, and what that can manifest as, how does, as an educator, I help my students in not only recognizing if they have withdrawal, but that day-to-day, -day, how do I support them and help them and educate them? Because that's the, this conversation has shown there's just so much to this. Yeah, I can jump in to start. I know in as part of the work that we've done here at Peachy Canada, we've developed some great activities that are aligned with provincial and territorial health curriculum, really from grade seven up. That really focus in on providing that education around substance use, vaping, and smoking more particularly. 
So one of those activities as an example is refusal skills, right? So how do we actually teach youth and empower and equip youth to know how to refuse in a friendly way with their peers when offered a substance, right? So that's a, that's a huge gap. And, you know, it's not just one activity that can fill that, but that's an activity that can really help to equip you so that when they leave the classroom and they, you know, they go out on the playground at recess or they're on the bus after school, that they have some sort of skills in their knapsack to refuse and feel confident and comfortable to do that. So there are a few activities that we develop on the Peachy Canada website. You can just search those at peachycanada.ca. So I think that's one thing. Another thing is that a lot of educators may not know this, but right now at the time of recording this podcast in the province of New Brunswick and the territory of Yukon, it is not illegal to vape in a school. And so the grounds in which educators and administrators have to not only have that educational piece, but any enforcement or any policies around that, they're really left to their own devices, so to speak, because we need more government support at the provincial and territorial level to protect schools from this. And even in other provinces like Saskatchewan, Manitoba, BC, and and most maritime provinces, it's currently not illegal to have vape products on a playground. And so that's really concerning because we know that schools have playgrounds. So I think we need to do a better job at the government level of supporting and protecting the school environment to then allow educators and administrators to have better policies around that too. I think that's just something that I wanted to note there as well for our listeners that, uh, that we have a long way to go as well. Ryan, I just want to jump back to the curriculum and the skill building that you spoke about first. And I I think for me as a physician, it's inspiring to hear about this. And I'm thankful that there are organizations working on this with young people because these skills to refuse or these skills to manage interpersonal relationships in the context of substance use, those are not innate, right? They, They really need to be taught and kids need to be guided and provided with the support to develop the ability to say no and and navigate that. So I, I think that's that's really critical and something that, you know, ideally many more young people and educators would have access to. I also want to throw out there that most youth that vape daily have have tried at least once in the last year to quit. So something like 67% as per some of the the national surveys. And so as educators, we you, you may be asking yourselves, like, how do we help youth stop vaping, right? If that's something that they may already be trying to do on their own. And, and I have a few ideas about this um, kind of big picture, including a encouraging young people to have open communication with their teachers um, and school staff, also with their families about both their mental health and substance use. But we, we also want to be able to provide youth with information and with access to resources to actually support them if they're going down this journey to make changes. So educators can can certainly help by familiarizing themselves with resources that exist in the community. So for example, in, in Ontario, there's a program through the Ottawa Heart Institute called the Quit Smoking or Quit Vaping Program that offers free telephone counseling um, and, and free nicotine replacement therapy for young people who are trying to make changes to their vaping. There are also youth hubs across the province that have various programming, including programs that help youth stop vaping. And mental health and substance use agencies exist like this across the country. And there are many provinces that have different resources that can support youth with their mental health or substance use. So just knowing you know, your local community environment um, and what exists can really help get kids connected with, with other supports outside of the school system. And there are also many school boards that have access to things like addictions counselors or mental health nurses that can be important supports to mobilize uh, for youth. So just being aware of, of the resources that may exist and then listening and communicating with young people when they they say that they're having a problem or they're, that they're trying to make a change and then intervening in the right time can be exceptionally valuable. I think one of the few big takeaways that I've taken from, from having this conversation is there's so much more going on than just vaping. There's so much more to it, be it mental health, be it coping, be it stress, be it any of the kind of psychological things, but that social aspect as well. So kind of going back towards withdrawal, but then looking back at the the triggers within an environment, what does that look like for a youth throughout the day within the school context? You know, to make it really, really simple for folks listening in, especially for educators, the school bell, the school bell is a trigger, right? So say the school bell rings to start the school day, that's potentially a trigger for a vape user to then use that, that product, right? These triggers can be super simple, 
and they're really just baked into our day-to-day routines. And so I think that it's important to remember that, you know, we can't always avoid all triggers, right? Like we can sometimes influence our environment and change certain things, but there's certain things that are just part of our day-to-day that are going to trigger that kind of want or that, that need to then use something like that product. So I think that it's important to remember, yeah, that those can be big or small. You know, we've seen in in more of the rural communities, the bus environment, as soon as students walk onto the bus, it's a trigger to use a vape product on the bus. And there's a high prevalence in some communities of vape usage on the bus. And and we're working with some schools to provide more education and uh, upstream prevention strategies for that. But I think that's another one, especially in the rural communities. I think I mentioned this, our environment shapes our behavior. And I think if you're, say you're going home after school and you see that that disposable vape product on the counter at your home, that's another trigger to then, or a reminder to use the product. So the home environment provides a lot of those triggers as well. Uh, and if parents who are listening in are wondering, you know, how can I maybe make a change there? Just putting those out of sight or not having those in the home can be really, really helpful as well. But then you also have that school environment that has those structure pieces uh, and and triggers there too. So it's really, really complex. And this is why this is such a complex issue because schools should feel safe and healthy for kids and they should want to go to school. And then that same healthy uh, environment for them can also be very triggering for them, which is a really, really complex issue to, to chat about as well. And I'll I'll add to Ryan's list there, a lot of adolescents tell me that the school bathroom is a big trigger, right? Um, A place where, you know, they may have engaged in vaping or others may have engaged or may be engaging in vaping, uh, especially once you've stopped or tried to cut down, it can be really, really triggering. I appreciate you both bringing that up. And the something that we've seen, and when I say we, I mean PHE Canada through the Stone Project, Ryan, in that the bathroom can be a, a place almost where it's hidden behind a closed door. Could you just share a little bit about you know what you're seeing in schools, what students are sharing with you, knowing that it's prevalent in all the schools that you've visited? Yeah, great, great question, Josh. A couple things there. First is that this is a coast-to-coast-to-coast issue. We are hearing this from schools all the way from Whitehorse to Yarmouth, that vaping in the washrooms is is a huge, huge issue. We don't necessarily have all the answers, and we're also on that learning journey too and supporting schools with what might be working through the Stomp Project as one example, but working with other partners and, and future projects as well. But from the student level, we've seen kind of two things. First, is that it's so prevalent in school washrooms. We've heard stories of five, six youth in a stall together, all vaping as quickly as possible before they get to their next class. So it's kind of become this group activity in that environment. When I was going to school, which I'm going to date myself here, but it was a few years ago, uh, that was just not a thing. And to think that that's a thing now is definitely different. Um, And so that's something that we have heard. The other thing that we've heard is that the youth that are not participating in that activity, they don't feel comfortable going to the washroom. You know, we've heard reports of students that are trying to hold it so that they don't go to the washroom. And we know that that's not healthy. They don't feel comfortable. They don't feel emotionally safe. We've heard students say that they don't like how other students are looking at them when they go into the bathroom. They don't like the smells in the bathroom. And so there's a lot of youth who are not using these products that are really susceptible as well. And we need to listen to their voices and make sure that those voices are heard because it's important, again, that all students feel comfortable in all parts of the school environment. And right now, that's just not happening in a lot of places. So again, I don't have all the answers, but those are just some things that that we've seen over the last few years for sure. Absolutely. And a difficult one for educators to address because the space itself is so complicated if that's one way of saying it maybe a, another topic for another day on the podcast appreciate you sharing your real life experience there ryan hey i think one thing i really want to talk about today is the long-term impacts of vaping and so far we've focused on the addiction side and getting started and, and why you are really moving into this like is there a period of time you know after six months things change and you know, share a little bit about the the long-term impacts of vaping Great question, Josh, and this is the million dollar question. We we actually have absolutely no idea about the long term mental health or physical health effects of vaping. You know, as as one young person who I've talked to before put it, it's you know, we're living experiments right now. 
There are very, very, very few research studies, even understanding what's in the vapes. And there are so many different types of vapes and so many different chemicals. So we don't know. We will know probably in 20 years, just like the information on the negative health effects of cigarette smoking took decades to to start to uncover and then publicly address. So unfortunately, there's really little that we can hang our hats on. But I think it's it's certainly safe to say that we know about nicotine and the potential harmful effects around mental health and substance use disorders related to nicotine. And then we unfortunately don't know anything else about those health effects. And I think that's something that may surprise young people because vapes have been advertised as being quote unquote healthy or quote unquote safe. But that's really not the reality in terms of what we would know about long-term outcomes. When you mentioned that we're living in an experiment right now with youth across Canada is alarming to say the least, but it's so true. Like you say, we don't know anything right now of the long-term impacts. A common argument, when you compare the two, what would you say to to someone who said, well, vaping is better than smoking? Many young people ask me this, or even sometimes suggest smoking as an alternative to stop vaping, which is exactly the opposite of kind of where we want to be with this right now. We know that smoking is dangerous. We know a lot about the health effects of cigarettes. We Also know that we don't know anything or nothing sufficient about the health effects of vaping. And we certainly cannot advocate for initiation of vaping, especially in young people who had never, never smoked, never been exposed to nicotine. This is just getting them into a potential problem that is a really hard to, to manage. It's really hard to quit. And we just, we just don't know. So that's kind of the takeaway. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. As we kind of get towards the the end of our time, I, I think one of the closing questions I really would love to ask both of you is, what does the future look like? When we think about vaping, when we, when we look at the youth across Canada, what does the future look like? I'll jump in. I love talking about the future. I'm a pretty optimistic person. So a great question there, Josh. Although I do got to say that Tay and I were both part of a, a really great research forum back in the spring of 2023, and there was some really alarming research, and there was basically just a balloon. It was looking at vaping prevalence within age groups in Canada, and we know that the 15 to 17 range is quite high, and then the 20 to 24 is quite high. And there, there's quite a bubble there of Canadians who are not only trying these products, but continuing to use these products. And I think as we look forward, Like Tay mentioned, it may take us 10, 15, 20 years to see the long-term effects of vaping now, but you know, those folks are going to be 40, 35 potentially, and we may see some alarming things there. And I I think that back to the point about not signing up for the experiment, there's a great website called notanexperiment.ca by Simcoe Health Authority. Definitely check that out because it's just really great. It really does explain that, that don't opt our kids into this experiment. Don't opt youth into this experiment because we don't know the ending and we don't know what that script is going to look like yet. And I can tell you, you know, based on what I know of what's in e-liquids, inhaling things like antifreeze, even at small levels, inhaling metals and plastics at high temperatures is probably not going to end well, but maybe we'll come back in 10 years and, and have that conversation and see. So I do think that that prevalence piece uh, with that, you know, 15 to 24 age range is something that we're going to kind of see as, as those folks age and continue on. And I think that we're just going to be continually, I think, a little bit behind the eight ball in terms of how do we just have better policies? How do we have better regulations and legislations at the provincial and territorial level to protect Canadians? I think it's something that I would love to see in the future. And I know that youth have been very vocal about this, especially in places like Yukon to really protect them and protect their younger siblings. So I'm hopeful as we continue to listen to youth that uh, we can get some answers and that we can you know, have some good actions moving, moving us as a country in the right direction and just letting those voices be heard, I think will be great. You know, I think from my perspective, moving forward, I, I just I want to see youth being better informed about vaping and, and other substance use as well, not just nicotine use and learning actual facts about the impact on their brain and, and on their bodies, because youth are making their own decisions and they need to be empowered to make decisions with all of the available information. And I think having parents and educators receive that same information and, and once again, help guide the conversations with young people is 
is incredibly important. And of course, as a child psychiatrist, I can't close without saying that I think we just we need to have improved access to mental health services. And that's that's really the investment that we need for young people across the country. Well, thank you very much to the both of you. Um, I took my three closing lessons that I learned from, from our conversation today. And I just kind of want to share those as well and echo some of the things both of you have mentioned. Kind of that educational piece, you mentioned it there at the end there around giving youth across Canada the, the hard facts of what it is that vaping is and all of that comes with it. I think, as we've mentioned today, the whole complex situation that comes with vaping, you know, the advertisement, the marketing, the withdrawal, the addiction, the long-term effects, the social aspect, the personal hygiene aspect of it. And then with that comes the resources and support. So making sure resources and support are offered to to youth, they have access and they have that knowledge, you know, that these great supports and, and organizations are there to, to help and hopefully they can access those before going to someone like Taya across the country. And then last, I think this can be difficult as an educator to to have these conversations, but really pushing that openness for educators and schools to address the issue and be open about it and work with students. I know through the STOMP program, you know, that student-centered learning approach of going to your students and, and um, highlighting what they need and want to improve vaping within the four walls of the school. So if we can encourage more teachers to have more conversations about vaping, I think in an accepting and open manner for youth, it will make a difference. So they were my three takeaways i think that's a great summary (laughs) thank you it was great to have you both today really appreciate it thank you to taya and ryan for sharing their perspectives on youth vaping and helping share some supportive strategies that could help you in your school we have so many unknowns when it comes to vaping but the journey begins with awareness let's continue working together to empower our youth with the knowledge and resilience needed to make healthy choices If you are passionate about fostering healthier, happier, and more resilient students, you're in the right place. Subscribe now, stay tuned, and let's empower the next generation together.